Hola, how's it going everyone? It's Illuminostic live streaming from the Amazon rainforest. <clears throat> Once again, it has been a really intense uh, couple of weeks. Lots of medicine work. Um, lots of exploring the rainforest, some <clears throat> environmental disasters creeping in on all sides. When we first arrived here in the Amazon, um, we couldn't see any of the destruction that was happening uh, to the rainforest without, you know, traveling a short distance by air or something. And uh, as of yesterday, I guess, I noticed that it's, it's reached our property in a very dramatic way. One of the rivers uh, in the backyard is gone. Um, and we walked up the road a couple nights ago, a guest and I, and uh, we discovered that I was correct in my assumption that the uh, illegal mining has um, is the culprit. They've created a like a, a, there are these big sort of ponds, I guess, artificial ponds, uh, pools where they process or wash the dirt, looking for the gold. Maybe they run a sluice in there. I'm not really sure. Uh, but, um, <clears throat> yep, the river's been dammed up so they can use the water. And it was an amazing little spot, you know, it was crystal clear water and a couple feet deep and just really great for just relaxing and cooling off. Um, hey, right on. Thanks a lot for subscribing, Ascending Ancient. Um, uh, and I will talk, I'll answer all those questions after we talk about the main point of this uh, live stream, which is ayahuasca. If there's stuff that's off topic, I'll get to it later. So you'll have to stick around. But um, anyways, it was a bummer to see that. But then it occurred to me that uh, I can do some non-invasive stuff uh, because if they're mining this river upstream, then that means that on our property, there's probably tons of gold uh, in the river there, which is now empty. So I can go in with a gold pan or build a little sluice and see what's up without doing any extra damage. So um, trying to see the silver lining in the, in the gray cloud. Um, anyways, though, I wanted to jump on and kind of talk about, uh, what I think the real message of ayahuasca is, um, because we really get a lot of mixed signals, I think, from the sort of pop culture, uh, mainstream ayahuasca narrative, um, and, you know, I think at the end of the day, we have to, if we really are sincere about pursuing truth and, um, you know, we really want to be objective about it, we have to acknowledge that people are basically apes and apes imitate each other. And so um, one of the things that I've observed is that, you know, people generally kind of will look at what the uh, major narrative is and just sort of adopt it as true. Uh, and the reality is that if you travel around the Amazon basin and you actually get to know Shuar and Ashwar and Shipibo and Warani and uh, Quechua and, you know, people from one of the 72 uh, ayahuasca using tribes down here, you quickly discover that what people accept as truths about ayahuasca uh, are not ubiquitous beliefs. They're not universal perceptions. Um, amongst different ayahuasca using tribes. And so uh, that sort of challenges, you know, for example, whether this Pachamama spirit of ayahuasca is actually female. Um, turns out that if you give people ayahuasca without telling them one way or the other, it's actually split right down the middle whether people perceive ayahuasca as male or female. Uh, there are also a lot of people who claim that a non- um, a uh, meat diet is essential, a vegetarian or vegan diet is essential preparation um, to drink ayahuasca. And the reality is that some of uh, the shamans that I know and in, in, that are barely contacted, I mean, you know, they saw a toilet for the first time 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, uh, some of the Warani people in town. Um, they, you know, the only, the only reason to go on a special diet regarding ayahuasca is when you're becoming a shaman. Um, but uh, prior to a ceremony, um, otherwise they're going to eat a monkey or whatever it is that, um, they're eating. And so having observed this all firsthand, I've done a lot of experimentation myself and I've determined that as far as I can tell, red meat makes absolutely no difference at all whatsoever. I have literally fasted for days before drinking ayahuasca. I've gone on 
uh, vegan diets for weeks before drinking ayahuasca, and I have eaten red meat uh, literally the same day. And there is no change in the depth of the experience, the quality of the experience, the amount of purging that I do, absolutely nothing. And so I'm not trying to criticize anyone or you know, belittle anyone or, you know, I just am interested for my own purposes in what the objective truth about all this stuff is. What is ayahuasca really? Um, what kind of diet is actually necessary? It turns out it's not a matter of safety um, at all. Uh, research has been done on that as well, and it turns out that's a myth. Um, for certain, uh, SSRIs are to absolutely be avoided, um, antidepressants, basically any kind of um, unnatural pharmacological substance at all. You know, aspirin is not okay. Ibuprofen might be fine. Um, but by and large, you know, avoiding uh, processed food, salt, uh, re refined salt, refined sugar, um, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals and uh, alcohol, uh, cocaine, you know, hard drugs, uh, anything that like really, really seriously boosts the serotonin. But other than that, it seems to me that a lot of what we're told is 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 just sort of um, pop culture woo, really. Uh, and so, um, you know, aside from my contentions with some of the protocol that's become accepted as like universal and standardized, um, you know, I'm really curious about the nature of the intelligence that inhabits the ayahuasca realm, uh, whether it's indeed some part of our own subconscious, um, you know, is it really a uh, male or female? Uh, you know what I mean? All of these sort of questions. What is really going on with ayahuasca? And uh, it, it turns out that you can't just consult with an indigenous shaman to find out because they all have different ideas about what it is. Um, and so, you know, when we have all these conflicting perceptions, um, you know, the only thing you can do is really investigate and determine for yourself. And so, my experience, of course, is going to kind of define my perception of what's happening. And um, my experience of these entities or, or, or spirits, as people call them, is that there is a sort of female narrator that seems to be more or less in charge of the uh, space. And I kind of think of it as the universal mind or the uh, spirit of the jungle, the guy in mind. Um, maybe you could call it. Uh, and then there are like secondary characters that I will encounter that will demonstrate things. Um, they'll make gestures, they'll do dances. Um, they don't speak with their mouths. It's always telepathic communication, which is 100%. You know, some of the stuff, what's going on, Anthony Driver? Thank you so much for uh, popping in and supporting us on Patreon. We really do appreciate it. I think our Patreon is a little bit higher than it's been in maybe a year right now. So we really appreciate that because uh, being demonetized, uh, you know, it's, I, I have to be able to justify putting hours into YouTube. And so you definitely um, allow me to continue to do this. Um, but so, uh, so yeah, there's like a fleet of supporting characters and then there's this narrator. And many, many times I have been interacting with some sort of entity or being or spirit or whatever these things are and I won't understand what is being communicated and that's when what people refer to as Pachamama will sort of step in with her narration. And usually I don't see this narrator. Um, once when she was really mad, mad at me, I, I, I perceived her as like, this head that was just a female head that was green because she was like uh, maybe jealous um, and just furious at me and sort of floating up angrily and then whizzing away angrily and I could tell she was very unhappy with uh, something I had done. Um, but I think that one thing that we can accept tentatively, uh, you know, I don't like facts, I don't like belief, I mean I like facts but I don't like to believe that things are facts. You know what I mean? Like beliefs, <laughs> uh, not objective facts or facts, but you know what I mean? Like believing in subjective things. Um, I prefer to let them remain possibilities that I'm entertaining. Uh, but I think that the um, one thing that I would almost absolutely assert as true or accept as true is that there is some sort of universal mind. There is some sort of greater consciousness that I think might be 
um, sort of the sum total of the collective of all the lesser consciousness. Uh, people have called it the Godhead. Um, it might even be more useful and accurate to think of it as like the Akashic Record or the zero point field where all of the information in the universe is, is stored. Um, by the way, these kind of ideas are not really that in conflict with modern physics, for example, because if it's true, for instance, that time isn't really linear, then an Akashic Record actually makes sense because every instance of everything that's ever happened still exists in a parallel multiverse or uh, another dimension or however you want to think about it. Um, so, you know, and that's, by the way, a useful tool, I think, um, if you're really interested in developing a, um, a, a holistic and deep and accurate knowledge of these realms and you want to be able to, to navigate them without becoming diluted, um, it, keeping abreast of physics and the natural sciences in general uh, and looking for correlations where your metaphysical experiences actually dovetail um, with scientific discoveries um, I think that's absolutely an essential um, facet of any kind of, you know, developing your consciousness in general. Uh, when people uh, embrace sort of the spiritual uh, and totally reject any kind of scientific method or protocol, uh, I generally find that they become muddle-headed mystics who have become so open-minded that wind is whistling through their ears. and. For me, that's not really desirable. Um, <laughs> Ice hockey mascot. Um, so yeah, I mean, and, and you know, another thing that really makes me feel that if nothing else, you know, uh, ayahuasca on an intellectual level or a metaphysical level, you know what I mean? The sort of the cerebral side of uh, spirituality um, one of the things that I find really interesting is that when people have like massive breakthroughs on high doses of DMT or ayahuasca, you know, I've seen this a few hundred times at this point, um, people generally come back with the same information, the same general information. And it's, it's very similar to what, you know, a lot of the great mystics have been telling us. It, it sounds similar to things that the Buddha said however long ago and a lot of other, you know, indigenous um, like uh, Native American um, chiefs and, you know, people that weren't disconnected, that hadn't been completely corroded and eroded uh, spiritually by the Matrix, tend to have basically the same um, metaphysics, I guess, would be a good word for it. Uh, and, you know, so I saw this even last week, you know, people realize that light is somehow generating consciousness and that that consciousness is um, not... It's always, it's like everything is conscious and the whole universe is consciousness uh, to varying degrees. And um, it even seems to me that when people press uh, these spirits for information, um, a lot of the nitty gritty details, the, the, the specifics uh, are, are also exactly the same. Um, one great example of that is this idea that everything is conscious, but the degree to which it can be conscious um, depends on its density. So a rock has some kind of fundamental consciousness, but it's so dense that it is less capable of uh, consciousness than a human brain, um, which is, you know, almost, it's a gel, almost. Um, I mean, Oblongo Grasso, uh, there's no way you could know that without having been a rock. So that's one of the kind of things that I would say that, you know, you, you can't really claim uh, knowledge of anything, uh, even if you've had direct experience of it. Um, but particularly if you haven't, I think that's, um, yes, the truth generally is extremely offensive to people. There's an old African proverb that he who speaks the truth has few friends. And as I get older and older and older and older and older and older, uh, I, I am constantly reminded and the, 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 the extent to which that is true becomes more and more clear. But, you know, long story short, I basically said, you know, in the description um, that I was going to uh, tell you guys what ayahuasca actually teaches. And, um, you know, just to make it clear, the reason that I was pointing out that we have 
no real consistent uh, protocol even for using ayahuasca. And we definitely don't have a universal description of what happens and what the spirits are. You know what I mean? We have all these variations. But there are some commonalities and there are some things that are extremely uh, consistent. You cannot know anything without God's revelation. Oh no, do we have a religious troll in the chat? Is there a way to delete them or something? Um, yep, look at that. Goodbye. <laughs> Adios. Um, yeah, so uh, the one consistent thing that we have uh, or a few things that actually boil down to one thing is that there, there is this access to information uh, via non-ordinary means, both um, uh, on a personal level, you know, like uh, uh, speaking from my own personal experience, um, information about very specific events that hadn't occurred yet, including names, time frames, you know, just not like Edgar Casey and uh, Nostradamus, where it's it's like this really vague prophetical stuff. It's like exactly the thing in exact specific language, and and then it's true every time. Um, so you know that has always been really compelling to me. And then um, just the idea of being able to access uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, uh, through non-ordinary means, which would be, I guess, would that would fall, things that would fall under that realm are like telepathy, precognition, remote viewing. Um, I'm pretty confident about all of those things. And another, um, another thing that happens that is extremely consistent that I find really interesting is what Daniel Pinchbeck called an occult hangover after contact with DMT and ayahuasca. Um, experiences of synchronicity and uh, what I call the universal mind uh, become really commonplace and after a while uh, just as normal as any other part of your life and I think that one of the reasons that people miss uh, a spiritual presence or um, a divine intelligence uh, that's sort of inextricably intertwined with every single atom in the universe um, is that you know its manifestations are constrained by the laws of creation. So, you know, if, if, if what it's going to take to uh, put a spiritual dimension, to add a spiritual dimension um, to your experience, is angels coming down out of the sky blowing trumpets, uh, you're probably going to be disappointed. But when you go to see a shaman um, in the Amazon, and he's trying to tell you that there's a universal mind that you have overlooked, and you're talking about your friend Ben, and then Ben messages, and he's not someone that anyone talks to uh, regularly. And then, um, you know, the shaman nicknames uh, one of the the people Lumpy because he um, hit his face into into a chanta palm and, and got a lump, uh, and he had named himself Lumpy on his chest profile a week before arriving. Um, or, uh, you know, on, I could go on and on just in the last like five days or something of that sort of thing. There was, uh, uh, just lots of, lots of stuff along those lines. I'm not going to get into all the nitty gritty details, but you know, that's, that's another element of it. I think that this universal mind, uh, once it has a conduit, uh, through which it can express itself, um, it will utilize that conduit uh, once you have expanded the parameters of your perception enough uh, that you are able to perceive um, these things. And I, I think that one of the things that we discover uh, with ayahuasca and other psychedelics is that a lot of the things that seem to be revealed uh, by these experiences or as a um, consequence of having had these experiences we're actually really just always there and uh, the reality is that if you are convinced that something's not there you'll fail to perceive it um, this happens even with commonplace like insects and stuff when I was a kid um, I remember there were these little 
they weren't glow worms. They were almost like a type of beetle with like uh, two little glowing dots on their butt. And I never noticed them until I was like 16 years old. And then every person that I pointed them out to had never seen them before. But once I saw them once, they were everywhere all the time. And it's, I, was, I, I, I was just always thinking, how could I have missed these things for the first 15 years of my life? And how is it that every single other person um, that I point them out to didn't ever notice them until I pointed them out? Uh, there was another um, uh, insect that that same sort of thing happened with. And, you know, an extreme case of this is the, uh, the, um, the arrival of the conquistadors in South America. The legend is that the uh, indigenous people could not see the ships uh, that were coming across the ocean, but they did see uh, the ripples in the ocean um, because they, could, they knew that was there and they could perceive it. And it wasn't until the shaman said, there are also ships, uh, these big wooden things that have, you know, people on them, um, that the tribe perceived them. Uh, I think there are, the UFO phenomenon uh, has characteristics that, that seem to be really reminiscent of that to me. Um, by the way, you guys, do me a favor and hit the like button, share these videos with anyone you think uh, may appreciate them or find utility in them. I am demonetized, which means not only that I don't get paid uh, for advertising, but the algorithm that pushes your videos actually buries my content because it's been flagged as, you know, worthy of censorship. So um, I really appreciate it. You know, the channel's still growing, and it's because of you guys and your grassroots efforts uh, to help me get the content out there because Facebook also has notified me that they're burying my posts. Um, and that means Instagram, you know, there's almost no way for me to promote. So I really do appreciate your sharing. Uh, also, if you'd like to make a one-time contribution, there are options in the chat for PayPal and Zelle and uh, Cash App and all that sort of thing. Um, also, you know, while I'm on this, on this uh, plugging, um, <laughs> on this, you know, on that trip, um, we are still booking for October and we're almost totally full and we're stopping November 1st um, for this year. Uh, we may resume at another amazing property. This place is mind blowing, but the price is gonna be way higher because the overhead is incredibly high compared to here. So, um, you know, if you're not rich and you wanna come to one of our retreats, uh, send me an email. And, um, and what we're doing basically is hermetic ritual magic, uh, and shamanism and plant medicine. So ayahuasca, changa, sananga, um, San Pedro, and we're working with local uh, Quechua people. And you also have the option of traveling uh, to Shuar territory to drink with Miguel Chiriot, but that's an additional um, charge. That's not part of, but all of the local stuff is covered um, when you book. So, okay, so where were we at with, um, Oh, and we're in the Amazon in Ecuador. I should probably mention that. I think we have like three or four spaces left for October, and then that's that's it. We're done. Um, it's been pretty amazing so far. Uh, it's uh, just amazing to, to, especially when people have never been to the jungle before, to just see their faces as we walk around. And there are monkeys here that will interact with you. Um, and a top ear that sometimes approaches and allows people to pet him. And uh, caimans and you know, parrots, it's the whole thing, the whole thing. Um, so it's just really great to watch people fall in love with the Amazon because it, it truly is the most extraordinary place on earth, um, in my humble opinion. And so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we have known, um, people, people that have been called initiates, the Pythagorean mystery schools and their, um, offshoots and brothers and sisters, uh, the, the, the truth about where the universe came from, um, what our purpose is, uh, you know, it's at least the fundamental basics, you know, when you look at, uh, certain elements of shamanism, whether you're talking about, uh, an ayahuasquero in the jungle in the Amazon or, uh, in the jungles of Borneo or in a Masonic temple or a Druid or, you know, I, I could go on and on North American, uh, uh, Native American traditions. Um, you will find certain consistencies, uh, that may be cloaked in myth, but it's really, really easy 
to see the underlying reality that has inspired um, the more poetic expressions and those things that are uh, that have cultural specificity that uh, you know separate them. Um, but for example, uh, you know we have the four directions in all of all of these traditions. There's generally at the opening of a ceremony. There's an acknowledgement of, you know, maybe the guardians of the north, east, south, and west, or the four archangels uh, in the four directions. Um, in the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram of the uh, of the Western mystery tradition, um, there are the the four Hebrew god names in each of the directions uh, and the archangels. And then we have a further uh, uh, um, association of uh, elements, which are uh, also corresponding to uh, different aspects of our soul or consciousness. So, for example, air is the intellect and water is the emotion and, and earth is like your financial stability and, and um, you know, fires, creativity and sexuality. And these things are extremely universal. And then they correspond with the directions as well, right? Um, and so you can keep um, sort of distilling or peeling layers off of um, these four fundamental uh, constituents uh, uh, of ritual, you know, whether you're talking about them as directions or elements or archangels or, you know, uh, facets of our, our being. Um, there are the four fundamental uh, uh, forces of physics. And that is what is generating all of these other layers underneath of um, these other ways of expressing them, right? So uh, it, it's, it becomes really obvious that there is some real substance to these conceptualizations that, you know, the, when the shaman or the North American medicine man, peyote road man, or uh, the magician, magician of the Western occult mystery tradition, um, you know, he's acknowledging these energies uh, and speaking about them in a myriad number of different ways, uh, we now can actually um, look at the constituent particles that make up those forces uh, and, you know, give them their uh, sort of primary form, their fundamental form, their most basic expression, uh, their structural manifestation in the wiring under the board uh, in the universe. Um, and so it's, it's really uh, uh, an amazing and an extraordinary thing to realize that we actually do have tools that allow us to peer through the veil of matter and to see uh, the substrate, the wiring under the board, um, and uh, to bring back models uh, even that are, uh, can be artistic but also even functional. Um, and, you know, I think as our uh, development and our... our uh, consciousness expands and uh, becomes more and more sophisticated uh, it, 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 in step with the technological advancement you know we should be able to start creating um, expressions of, of, of this knowledge this dovetailing of science and mysticism um, that transcend either category of uh, spirit or matter that walk a fine line um, that are, you know, just as much uh, in the realm of, of pure consciousness as they are a technological fabrication. Um, we are extremely close to that. And uh, the potential and possibilities uh, are absolutely limitless. And, you know, tools like ayahuasca are just starting to um, be... I don't want to say understood because I don't know if that's really possible, but uh, at least, you know, understood to the extent that uh, that they can be utilized um, by Western minds and, and, and by modern people. Um, this is a new development and I, I we're we're right on the cusp of something major, you know, and I, I know that there's a lot of um, opposition out there. There's a lot of dissonance in the world right now. There's a lot of disharmony, fear, uncertainty. Uh, however you want to talk about it, there's a lot of, of stuff that's happening that's extremely threatening. But, you know, again, if we look back into 
um, the spiritual traditions, the metaphysical conceptualizations of the adepts uh, of, of the secret doctrine of the ages. Um, one of the uh, bits of knowledge that we find is that order comes from chaos. Uh, and so I think that the dissolution of order in order to make space for, uh, for movement is just an essential part of the process and that we shouldn't be afraid of it. Um, it is just one phase of the solvet coagula, um, the, the, the dissolution and um, coagulation. Another way uh, to think about it that I, I really like is um, from the, the, the Hermetic tradition or the Pythagorean um, mystery schools, uh, a lot of people mistakenly believe that an inverted pentagram is a symbol of evil. And if you are a Christian Gnostic, then it, I guess it is a symbol of evil because um, what it symbolizes is the idea that in the beginning, uh, it was consciousness itself, um, light, you could say, because, you know, all lighters, are, all matter is light in a standing wave. Um, that this, this consciousness and light uh, made this descent into matter and sort of crystallized uh, to really oversimplify it. But that's all that is a symbol of, um, the descent of spirit and light into matter to animate it and um, uh, uh, so that the... Uh, electromagnetic wave guided by uh, consciousness uh, could impose symmetry on the chaotic uh, energy in the primordial stew and give rise to order, right? Um, order out of chaos. Uh, and the pentagram uh, with the point up symbolizes that at the end of that um, process, the alchemical transmutation of the entire universe um, from lead into gold, which is matter, into light, right? Uh, the redintegration of that matter back into spirit or light um, is this this other symbol. And so this process of of solvet coagula um, really uh, does describe all of the universal processes. Because you know, speaking of mystery traditions that had something right, uh, you know the. Um, uh, Jewish mysticism, which there's a lot to unpack. I almost didn't want to mention it because I could get stuck here for hours. Um, but if you look at the process that's outlined in the uh, Kabbalistic Tree of Life, the light of Keter as it passes through the three veils of negative existence and then is harmonized as it moves through the spheres of the Sephirot, which are nearly identical, uh, at least down the center line, um, to the chakras of the Vedic system, I guess, is where we got that. Um, the light travels down and it crystallizes in Malkut, which is the realm of matter. Um, so, uh, and then again, we have this in physics uh, with quantum loop theory, which is basically the idea that it all started as light and then, you know, this matter uh, crystallized. And then once all of the possibilities and potentials have been exhausted and there's nowhere for the universe to go, the process reverses, the light consumes itself, which is what the Ouroboros um, consuming its own tail. It's a dragon of light, the one that Hermes saw. Uh, it reverses, the light consumes itself, it collapses back into the singularity, starts over again, and more order comes from chaos, right? And I, you know, I kind of went through that a little bit just to show that it is universal, this idea. Um, it's also present in, uh, in the Hindu uh, uh, religion, um, the blinking of the eye of Shiva, you know, so when um, the eye sleeps, uh, we wake, and when the eye opens, the universe explodes, and it's quantum loop theory uh, in a fable, basically. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, and I guess what I'm saying is that, uh, for me, at least, at the end of the day, ex except for the emotional cleansing and the uh, ability to um, repattern uh, negative beliefs and habituations, um, and to find new ways to relate to our old traumas. Um, you know, that's all really important stuff that ayahuasca does. Um, but for me, probably the most extraordinary thing that it does is that it allows you to observe um, firsthand uh, these processes that I'm describing in a way that cannot be communicated by me in language. Um, it's like consciousness in its raw form uh, is self-organizing. Uh, the organizing principle in the universe, I believe, is consciousness. 
And so, um, because these spirits, I guess, uh, or the visions, um, by the way, I would define spirit as sort of a coherent manifestation of consciousness that doesn't have the same density as like human flesh or meat. You know what I mean? It, it that's, that's what I sort of how I think of spirits. And I, I think that in this realm, uh, that ayahuasca gives you a win window into, to, um, view, uh, that, that, that realm it's it's sort of an inter intermediary place, right? It's it's not nothingness, um, but it's not solid in the way that uh, Malkut, the realm of matter, as it's um, termed in the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, you know, it doesn't have that level of density. And so, um, the things that tie the two worlds together uh, it can be demonstrated in ways that you know language is too limited. Um, and there's really nothing in this world uh, because of the constraints um, that are imposed on it by the laws of creation. Uh, you know, you have to find a way through, around, or over um, the limitations of, of the, the, the density uh, of matter in order to perceive these revelations uh, or these sort of revelatory visions. So... Um, let me go back through here, and maybe the guy that asked this question is still, um, still here. Man, that was a while back. It was something about the 72 lesser keys of um, Solomon. Um, it's difficult for me to, to, to really give like a, a, a short and succinct answer to that. Um, but the number 72 does have a lot of really weird significance, uh, as does uh, the number nine, which 72 reduces to. Um, but I, you know, I think that the best way to think about demons, right? And this this is uh, another one of those things that I think pop culture is really doing a lot of harm. Um, you know, people become spiritual and they think they're supposed to just repeat what everyone else is saying um, because that's just what people do. And uh, I hate to tell people, but that's not spirituality. That's not expanded consciousness. That's nothing but getting out of one box and climbing into another one. And um, what you really have to do is free your mind um, and your ego uh, from the influences that compel us to uh, behave like that. Um, but, uh, you know, the idea of negative or evil entities, I don't buy it at all. Um, partly because I have never once in my entire career or history as a facilitator as uh, a, an ayahuasca drinker myself, a DMT smoker, whatever, you know, um, and then also in my ritual magic practices, I have never encountered any kind of being or entity that has ever told me to do anything harmful to myself or anyone else. And it's occurred to me that maybe the reason um, for that is that in the spirit world where it's just pure consciousness, there's no such thing as death. You can't cut your leg. You can't break a bone. They just don't even have any concept of that. You know, it doesn't mean anything there. It's just infinite consciousness. And they're like, you know, what, is, what, is, what even is that? Um, and, you know, a, a lot of, of shamans actually have been influenced by the Judeo-Christian uh, and particularly Catholic um, religion at this point. And their belief in evil spirits like the devil actually comes from... Uh, and it's not even the Judeo-Christian tradition because Jews, Jews don't believe in, uh, evil spirits really either. Um, it's, it's not like that. And so that's really, a, a sort of Christian, um, I would call it a heresy really. And, uh, you know, there are lots of tribes here, um, that don't even have words for evil spirits. So it's, I think it's a way that people will come up with a scapegoat uh, to avoid taking responsibility for themselves, that there are parasitic entities 
draining their prana and so they just can't get their shit together and um i i i just i don't buy it i don't i think that what another another way to think about that is that um in 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 the mystery tradition or in what i think of as like the authentic uh, metaphysical model that I, I think is correct. Um, the negative, the passive, uh, the void, um, chaos, uh, these things are not objective evil. Um, that doesn't exist outside of human behavior for the most part. Um, and so I think that, you know, where there are intelligences in the universe that are capable of activity they're generally going to be positive or more or less neutral because they are not uh, passive, void. Um, we associate negative with evil, dark, bad, um, but I think on a cosmic scale, negative and positive do not mean those things. It's passive and active. Um, and so, you know, I... I, I think that it, it what it represents is a sort of childish or immature superstitious conception of what uh, spirituality and consciousness really are. Um, and I have tested this in all sorts of different ways and I have not been harmed due to my position on this. So I feel like I've proved it. Uh, I just, uh, so um, and then the other way to answer this question about demons, basically, is that uh, in the time that, that Solomon would have lived, if Solomon was a real person, which I'm very much in doubt of any biblical character having existed, um, it's basically a certainty that there was no Jesus of Nazareth uh, at this point. Um, but, you know, demon would have been related to the Greek word daemon, which just means spirit. It doesn't have any negative connotations at all. But even if we uh, accept the negative connotation of a demon and we think of them as lust, pride, guilt, uh, envy, you know, the seven deadly sins um, sort of incarnated, um, the reality is that there is one consciousness, right? Uh, there's nothing that is not God, right? The, the, the divine uh, consciousness that exploded into all of these different things is it's like a hologram. We all are the entirety of it. Like the her, her Kabbalion says, the the all is in the all, um, which means that the all is in every part as well. And um, so to consider uh, some aspect of consciousness as being separate from you doesn't really make any sense. Uh, if you're taking that knowledge seriously, and if you're not, then you're pretending to believe that all is one because you think that's what you're supposed to say to be spiritual or because it sounds nice to you or something, but you don't actually believe it. So you have to make a choice. Like, are you really one with everything or are you just saying stuff that sounds deep uh, because that's, you know, you hear it a lot or something. Um, you know what I mean? So uh, these demons, I don't think, really exist externally to us. There's no reason to think of them that way. And so in the actual traditions of magic, uh, you know, outside of pop culture, superstitious, um, sort of uh, silly, immature versions of this, a real magician understands that the internal and the external isn't fundamentally different. And so when he's trying to constrain a demon to his will, what he's actually doing is ritualizing the process of communicating with his subconscious. And he is trying to constrain uh, the demon of greed um, and transmute it through alchemical uh, uh, mastery into ambition right? So there are variations of all of these demonic forces that can be constrained to your purpose. And so all, all of these forces uh, that are described in 72 Keys of Solomon are just fundamentally aspects of consciousness that you are trying to map 
and am constrained to do your will. Um, so I know that was a rather long-winded way um, of explaining that, but that's um, that's what I think of of that. So if you guys have any more questions, um, it's only been about 45 minutes. Um, So, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, you have to give me a second to answer though, because I do have a lag. It'll take a few seconds. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you guys so much for spending this time with me. Um, I hope that there was useful information. Um, it's certainly been useful to me. Uh, and, um, again, you know, support the channel if you can. Uh, there are options for supporting in the description and, oh, by the way, for my patrons, I apologize. I didn't do the secret stream on Sunday. I was busy with, uh, people were leaving and I, I needed to take care of that. So, um, sometime this week when I have an hour, maybe tomorrow during the day, I'll pop on and, um, we'll do a secret stream. Um, The Misty Matt, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, the inner bad side, yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm saying. I mean, um, $32,523. dollars. I hope you sent that to my crypto wallet address. That would be really helpful to have $32,523. Um, that would be great. Let's see, is there anything else that is, um, you know, that's basically, I think I did forget to summarize what I think ayahuasca is doing for people. And uh, one of the things that I, I've, I've been trying to establish is that there are a lot of people that are really just kind of mimicking the people around them. Um, and I have literally seen indigenous shamans tell people what they have read on the internet. They expect them to say rather than what they actually believe, because, uh, what happens to people a lot of times is that if you're an actual real traditional indigenous shaman, um, and people have read on the internet stuff that they believe, they'll think you're fake if you're not doing that stuff. So these people will actually disregard their real traditions in order to conform to the expectations of the people that are paying them, which is absolutely horrible. I mean, it's actually killing traditions. Um, so that's one of the reasons, you know, that I, I mentioned this stuff, even though a lot of people, uh, you know, think that about me because I'm challenging um, you know, the stuff that they read on the internet, I guess, that they've already decided they believe and it's just, they can't handle it. <laughs> I don't know, but, um, you know, and I think also there are people that have an agenda, you know, there's a lot of vegans that really believe that everyone in the world needs to become vegan. And so there are a lot of people out there that, um, believe that ayahuasca is going to try to like turn them into a vegan, that this Pachamama is going to transform them into a vegan because that's what enlightened people do and and it's absolutely not real i mean um the ayahuasca doesn't really even necessarily make you passive because you know there are ayahuasca drinking tribes in the amazon basin that still spear each other to death on occasion so this is it's just not real that's not what I, that's not what ayahuasca does um i'm not saying it isn't good to be a pacifist i totally do i'm just saying that you know, if you're looking for objective reality about this stuff, that's not it. Um, it's, it, ayahuasca is not trying to turn you vegan. It's not trying to make you a pacifist hippie. It's not trying to do any of that stuff. What it does is help you, um, see what you need to see and understand what you need to understand in order to adapt to your environment, um, the best. Uh, and, and so those are the kind of transformations, um, that it's going to catalyze. Uh, and so, if you are, you know, a um, upper middle class liberal from San Francisco, uh, it very well um, may uh, encourage you to be a vegan pacifist because in your environment for your life, that may be the conditions that will allow you to thrive the best. Um, but 
if you are an Oshawar living traditionally way out in the middle of the jungle, it's going to tell you how to throw your spear uh, with more ferocity so that you can defend your village. Um, you know, it just is there to, it, it, I am convinced that it does want to support vitality of living things because I think it's sort of like an avatar, uh, the being that you encounter or the intelligence, the consciousness uh, that inhabits the ayahuasca realm um, is like the life force uh, that has been, what is the word for when we make people, make things human? Um, there's a word for it, but you guys understand what I mean. It, it's anthropomorphized uh, life force, I guess. Um, and so, you know, and that's amazing. That's, that's you know, an, it, it's an extraordinary, uh, well, Bogzilla, I don't know that it's feminine. Um, like I said, if there are, it's not unanimous with all the tribes that Pachamama is a woman. Um, Pachamama is not any tribal name. It's basically Spanish. Um, there was no Pachamama before like 1993. It literally did not exist. Uh, you know, they, Mother Ayahuasca um, may have been used by the Quechua and, and some other people, but you know, there are some tribes that think it's androgynous, some that think it's male. Um, so it's interesting to me that people have sort of adopted a belief and you know why? I can tell you why. Because the Shipibo have become the uh, main ayahuasca industry um, go-to tribe, and that's what they say. So there are more people that have heard that, so it's become the dominant narrative. People are primates, and they imitate each other, and that's it. So, um, you know, it's just, it's, there is no objective truth there. Um, and, you know, you guys can literally watch uh, how many people are watching. And every single time I will mention something that, that goes, that flies in the face of what people have already read, uh, online, the number will drop every time. Um, and, and I think that's, it's really unfortunate that, that people, uh, people that he who speaks the truth has few friends, I guess. Um, but yeah, and I, I think it's also important to go into these things without these preconceptions. Uh, without these expectations that there's some loving hippie, uh, you know, spirit woman that's, you know, going to help you become a vegan uh, so that your virtue signaling is, is more efficacious. You know what I mean? That's that's just not real. Um, and so I, I think that the, uh, the things that people believe that they're carrying into ceremony with them can actually obstruct the development that they actually need to undergo. You know, I'm not trying to be a troll here. I'm actually saying these things with a purpose, and um, it's 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 important to realize that no one knows what they're talking about when it comes to this stuff um, in any sort of you know absolute way like that. There is no universal standard um, for any aspect of ayahuasca, and I don't think there's supposed to be. In fact, um, another thing that is is really alarming i guess and a bit ridiculous and again it comes down to money in the ayahuasca industry um but the idea that you know most people seem to believe this is true that uh, an ayahuasca shaman apprenticeship is three years usually and you study under someone and blah 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 and, and traditionally that's pretty much never ever was the case with any tribe anywhere um that's something that someone made up because they wanted someone to give them money for three solid years. Um, but there's, that's not a real thing anywhere. Look, look through the anthropological record. If you don't believe me, that's not how a shaman is made. Um, and you know, another thing that is disturbing about a lot of these, uh, like facilitator courses and stuff is that, you know, it, traditionally speaking, if that's valuable to you, um, it's, that's not an option. Uh, shamans are chosen by the universal mind, by the Gaian mind, by the ayahuasca spirits, by um, experiences in their life that have uh, left them uh, uh, predisposed to uh, uh, shamanic work, um, or um, they're born that way. 
but you don't just, you know, go pay $12,000 and have someone teach you and then you're valid, uh, validated because you have paid a bunch of money and, you know, it's, and, and I, I do believe that, that I've met a lot of people, I don't think any amount of training um, would ever necessarily result in uh, them being qualified uh, for that for that type of work. So there's an awful lot of stuff going on that has has been influenced by you know the the mainstream pop culture narrative, um, a lot of wishful thinking, uh, a lot of uh, the fact that there's a certain demographic that was drinking ayahuasca before it became super popular and those people define the protocol and they were basically hippies. And that's where a lot of the perceptions about what it, what it does and what it's for come from. Um, it has nothing to do with tradition. In fact, a lot of it flies right in the face of what uh, people, indigenous people actually think about it. Yeah, Bogzilla, that's also true, you know, that, uh, that whether you make the brew with uh, Chaliponga or Amiruka or both or um, Mimosa Hostilis or, you know, whether you use Syrian Rue or uh, Benisteriopsis Kapi, um, you know, if, if, if these plants actually do tend to lean towards a masculine or feminine um, identity, uh, fundamentally, vibrationally, or as a spirit, you know, however you want to think about it, um, then yeah, it's going to, it's going to be different. Um, my point is just that there is no universal perception and, you know, it, my, my contention with all of that is just that it will, it has the potential to, um, cloud people's, uh, to influence them. Um, and they go into it with preconceived notions and expectations that could actually interfere with them receiving information that they actually need to heal. Um, and this, this realm of pure consciousness where ayahuasca operates, uh, things are subtle. Of course, the experience can be extremely powerful um, and overwhelming, um, but still, our ability to receive what it means is subtle um how how that's communicated so it really doesn't take much to interfere with our ability to receive the information that we actually need to receive um another thing that is worthy of consideration i think that so many people uh are you know they don't want to hear um, but it's, it's definitely valid it is that, uh, for the most part, there are tribes that drink ayahuasca socially, right? So the whole tribe would drink together, but most cases, the shaman drank the ayahuasca and then he tried to help someone. Um, but the person that he was helping did not drink it. Um, and sometimes I think that people that have not prepared themselves with years of working with the universal mind, uh, internal work, uh, that have developed objectivity and critical thinking, um, skills to a very high degree should not drink ayahuasca. Um, because you know, I, I feel like maybe you actually should be a shaman before you try to just cast your consciousness out into the vast sea of, you know, unrestrained consciousness, right? This idea that we have filters in our nervous system that screen out most of the sensory input that's coming in from the universe, right? We see less than 1% of the full spectrum of light and, you know, all this other stuff along those lines. Uh, maybe that shouldn't just happen to just whoever wants to pick up a cup and drink it. And, you know, of course, myself and any, any retreat center or any, you know, responsible um, shaman is going to ask some questions, um, but I, I do honestly question whether or not it actually makes sense for people to just drink ayahuasca that aren't committed um, to metaphysics and spirituality and consciousness in a healthy way as well. Um, uh, another reason why I really uh, encourage 
people to study the mysteries and the physical sciences and to have the courage uh, to challenge their own beliefs and to engage in critical thinking and all of that stuff um, that I think is really necessary. If you're going to expand your consciousness, you're carrying more weight. Uh, you have greater responsibility to yourself and the rest of the world. Um, you also have more to manage. Um, you know, it's, it's really a lot more involved and complicated than a lot of people um, believe. You know, like not just anyone can come see me. You, we have to do a Zoom call at first uh, before that can happen where I'm going to at least try to make sure that not just that you don't have any major health problems or mental health issues, but also that you're a sort, certain kind of person because I, I just, I don't think that just anyone should be drinking ayahuasca. Um, the caveat that I will make is that I think that because of the toxicity of our culture and the damage that is done uh, by our society and parents that were raised by parents that were fucked up and, you know, also damaged by this incredibly toxic culture, uh, you know, even people that seem, seem to be well-adjusted, you know, if you're well-adjusted to a maladjusted, you know what I mean? Well-adjusted to a sick culture is just mentally ill. It's not... Anyways, um, what I'm getting at is I think that people in general are so far out of alignment that um, if you're going to have to choose a lesser of two evils scenario, people drinking ayahuasca on a mass scale, the good probably outweighs the bad. Um, and, you know, given that, I think that it would be advantageous if people that were doing it had a bigger picture than just preparing by not eating certain foods and and you know what I mean uh, uh, I think that there's a lot more work that needs to be done in order to really get the most out of these experiences and even to ensure that they don't do more harm than good which is certainly um, something that happens from time to time uh, this is why I offer free integration with our retreats, um, you know, flow state lifestyle, I call it. Uh, and it's basically a way to ensure that there isn't a hill and valley experience, um, the sort of like manic peak experience that you have. And then the rest of your life seems so bland and banal uh, and mundane by comparison that you're, you can't handle it anymore. Um, for a lot of us, if you have the capacity to escape that, um, that's a good thing to realize you feel that way. Um, but you know what I mean? We, you, you, you have to, uh, do a lot of work and take a lot of steps. Um, not only to mitigate harm, uh, the potential for harm, uh, but just, just to try to get the most out of, out of the changes that, that are available to you, um, after you experience something like, like ayahuasca. And, you know, there are diets that are very helpful, um, eating a lot of foods with L-DOPA, the precursor to dopamine, and understanding dopamine management. Um, that's one of the main reasons that our society is so fucked up. If people just are be they're, they're being manipulated via dopamine, and, um, you know, you can really consciously structure your dopamine levels in a way that would negate um, a lot of, of the worst things that happen in our society, really. Um, so that, and I think also, you know, every person um, should have structured into their life as many flow state triggers as possible. Um, and so if, if you engineer, re-engineer your life after an experience like ayahuasca, um, so that there are flow state triggers uh, everywhere, and you know you you uh, have a diet that supports um, that supports that. Uh, and remember that dopamine isn't just a reward chemical; it, it is also responsible. It's the great motivator. Um, so what you have to avoid is big dips, right? So if you can raise it and then keep the plateau and raise it a little bit more, um, so that your baseline level of dopamine is higher and higher and higher, but without these massive dips. Um, then, you know, you are really going to be able to 
uh, take peak experiences like ayahuasca and maintain that level um, without having to continue to consume psychedelics all the time. Although, for the record, I don't think there's any reason why you shouldn't um, consume uh, uh, psychedelics uh, pretty regularly. Um, the, the research, the evidence is there, you know, unless you are predisposed to mental illness, um, even moderately heavy uh, um, use of, of psychedelics is beneficial um, and, and it, it's not harmful. So, yeah, that's the thing, you know, like most people are not equipped to navigate um, these, these realms in a way that is as meaningful as it could be, I guess. Um, it's not always dangerous or harmful, but, um, yeah, I mean, you know, extreme Chris, you're extreme, it's in your name, um, but honestly, you can drink ayahuasca every day for a month if you're not predisposed to mental illness, and it will not harm you. Um, I've, I haven't done quite that, but, you know, over the course of two months, maybe 50 times or something, uh, I'll drink, and, during certain periods and um you know I, I i drank ayahuasca twelve times in the last sixteen days or something and you know do I seem like i'm if anything i think i may be a little bit more uh uh lucid um and inspired than i i was uh the week before that so you know, I mean, it's kind of counterintuitive that you can take this psychedelic that makes LSD look like Tylenol and um, and and there's no adverse effects. Uh, and, but I have I know people that drink infinitely more than I do. I mean, there are Shuar, Shaman, um, Miguel Chiriop that I know, you know, they have this thing they do where for 28 days almost straight they're drinking uh, once a year. And nothing wrong with him um I, I i know a few people that have probably had over twenty thousand cups uh as facilis facilitators and shaman over a period of maybe 10 years um and they're if anything more balanced and healthy um than people that don't do that so you know it's as i'm always saying uh when people ask me if lsd causes mental illness i say yes in the people that don't take it. Um, yeah. Which isn't to say that ayahuasca isn't dangerous. Um, it definitely can be. Uh, people can have um, issues that they don't know are there. So, you know, when they uh, do their intake questionnaire, they say, you know, I don't have any serious issues. They're not being deceptive. Um, but you know, maybe they're doing something that they don't realize they're not okay with. And they're carrying a tremendous amount of guilt and shame um, and self-loathing. Uh, and then they, they, they drink ayahuasca and suddenly they're beating their face into a palm tree um, and trying to rip their own teeth out uh, because um, they, they've been doing sex work uh, uh, with, you know, strangers and subconsciously it was destroying them and they didn't realize that they thought they were okay with it you know what I mean I've I saw that once so uh you know what I mean it's 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 I'm not you know what I'm saying that you can consume an awful lot of it and not do any harm to yourself um I just wanted to be clear that I'm not saying that it isn't it isn't dangerous in some cases Um, I'm assuming extreme Chris that you have never drank ayahuasca because drinking it with every meal would not be possible. You would die because you would vomit up every meal. Um, yeah, well, actually Robin Williams didn't originally say that. Um, it was Tom Waits, uh, Reality is for people who can't face drugs, I think, was his, um, which I don't, I don't really like. And, uh, you know, Waits was talking about alcohol and cocaine and, and heroin and stuff like that. Not, um, these type of medicines, psychedelics, uh, I think it's unfortunate that they were ever lumped into that category of drugs because, 
um, you know, for me, I, I've learned over time that ayahuasca, it's, it's not that it causes you to freak out. Uh, you're actually just as lucid as you are any other time. It's your reaction to the experience that can be problematic, right? Whereas something like LSD uh, sometimes will cause people to just straight up, they're losing their minds. Um, uh, you know, it, it is actually sort of intoxicating. It has that quality. Uh, at, at least, you know, f speaking from my point of view, as I gained experience, I realized that ayahuasca and DMT is, is not really intoxicating. It's more like pressing a button in an elevator and then suddenly you're not where you were before. You're somewhere else. Um, but your mind isn't really clouded or, you know what I mean? It's, it's, just, a, it's just not like that. I can't speak for everyone, but that's how I experience it. Uh, Robin Williams, you know, it's funny that you mentioned that in, in the context of ayahuasca because one of the things that I've noticed that ayahuasca does, and it's, it's not just my observation, this has been known for hundreds of years uh, by Western people, or known to Western people, um, to shamans much, much longer, but, uh, you know, a long time ago, uh, the Harmala alkaloids were actually called telepathine and telepamine. Um, I guess it would have been tetrahydroharmine and, and, and harmaline. Um, and so uh, that's a very common um, experience, and it's undeniable, it's absolutely undeniable. Um, there's, there's no possibility of chance in some of the circumstances where I've experienced this. And it's not necessarily even during the ceremony. Sometimes the next day, uh, for example, one night I was laying on the deck and I realized I could see through the center of my forehead it was, it was not clear because there's bone and blood in the way. It was kind of orange, but I could see. And the next morning when I saw the shaman, the first thing he said to me was, sometimes you can see through your forehead when you drink the medicine. The reason it turns out, after I got home, I did some research and discovered that the pineal gland actually has rods and cones and is wired to the uh, visual cortex. And so, um, you know, DMT apparently literally turns on your third eye. People talk about, you know, third eye activation and it literally just like flips a switch and you can see through it um and so the first thing he said to me when i saw him the next morning is uh sometimes you can see through your forehead when you drink the medicine right just not like how's it going how was last night what do you want for breakfast or whatever none of that just straight to you know sometimes you can see through your forehead when you drink the medicine uh also one time that same guy uh i was thinking about um what to say to my now partner uh, uh, before we were dating, um, considering inviting her, uh, out to dinner. And I thought, no, it should be tea. Um, and then I opened my eyes and the shaman sitting beside me and he looks at me and he says, the German girl, invite her to tea, but by the river. And there's just no, there's no possibility that in my mind that he just randomly, you know what I mean? It, it's, it's just the filters and our nervous system are down and we're able to pick up stuff that is normally filtered out because it, it would overwhelm us and we wouldn't be able to survive. Um, but anyways, Robin Williams, um, I'm not a huge fan, you know, I don't ever think about Robin Williams, but the moment that he died, um, I thought, I wonder what Robin Williams is up to these days. I haven't heard of a movie or anything. And, and then two, two hours, three hours later, my girlfriend came to pick me up from work and she's like, Robin Williams killed himself a couple hours ago, and it was more or less at exactly the moment that I wondered what he was doing. Um, you know, so uh, long story short, you don't necessarily even have to drink ayahuasca to experience telepathy. Also, when my mother uh, committed suicide, I actually said to um, the person I was having lunch with, um, uh, I need to call my mom, I'm worried she's gonna hang herself. And at that very moment, um, she, was, she was hanging herself. Um, so it was not like I just said I'm worried she's going to kill herself, but I knew specifically uh, what she was doing. Um, there had been no threats or anything, not since I was a kid. I mean, I had heard her say that she would kill herself, but only between the ages of like four and 17, probably.
because I cut contact mostly, but uh, anyways, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's a real thing for sure, um, and I think this was all catalyzed, uh, originally, this, 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 this narrative here, um, by the fact that I was just talking about how our nervous system filters out most of the universe and ayahuasca takes those filters down. Um, and if you come into it, uh, with a clear slate, without expectations, without preconceptions, um, the information that you receive is accurate and, um, usually, uh, helpful in some way. Okay, so it has been uh, now a couple of hours, I think. Last time I said I was gonna, was gonna... Uh, Extreme Chris, uh, Beocyst and um, Azorescens, uh, Psilocybe Azorescens has the highest um, levels of Beocystine of any um, psychedelic mushroom. And uh, I suspect that it's, it's the reason for the paralysis. Um, the, the first time I ate Azorescens, uh, I had picked them myself. Um, uh, thank you, Bogzilla. Uh, I had picked them myself on the coast of Oregon, uh, or maybe it was southern Washington, right on the border, wherever the peninsula. There's an 11 mile peninsula um, that is absolutely covered in mushrooms. Um, no, it's, it's, I thought it was only Azorescens that did this. I've never heard of Cyanescens causing the paralysis. Um, but yeah, so we ate them and as they were wearing off, I was eating a banana and suddenly my jaw just didn't work anymore. And I had to grab the bottom of it and use my hand to chew the banana so I could swallow it. My, luckily my tongue still worked. Um... And then the next day we were going for a walk and suddenly my leg just didn't work anymore. Uh, it's really, really disconcerting, um, especially if you don't know um, why it's happening. And I didn't know. Uh, I did have the presence of mind um, to look up the uh, mushroom and see uh, if that was known. And what blew my mind is that, you know, I've been doing research on all of this stuff forever and I... I just didn't understand how they could cause something that drastic, and I had never seen any reference to it. Um, but anyways, my throat is starting to hurt from talking so much, and I'm going to not be coherent anymore soon. So thank you guys so much for spending this time with me. Please like, share, subscribe, share the videos, because we are demonetized, which means that uh, the algorithm ignores me. Um, so I, the only reason my channel grows is because of your... Uh, grassroots efforts to share these videos, um, both Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, all they've all told me, this is not like paranoia, that they uh, they bury my, my stuff. Why they don't just delete you all together, uh, they do that sometimes, but um, yeah, so they bury me. I need your help if I'm going to um, continue to have an audience. And then if you want to support one time, uh, there are options in the description and the chat. We are having retreats in the Amazon, in the Ecuador, where you can study hermetic magic, go on exploratory trips to waterfalls and top of your island and interact with monkeys and drink ayahuasca with local indigenous um, shaman and mamas, uh, female shaman, um, only until the end of October, and that's it. So uh, very affordable compared to just about everywhere else I've seen. Um, so... I uh, thank you guys so much for spending this time with me, and we'll see you again very soon.